So many of you will know our next speaker, Annabel Gaberti, who is the president of ELC and also founding partner of law firm Crevoffi. Annabel specialises in advising clients in the creative, fashion and luxury sectors. Uh, she'll be discussing a number of trademark infringement claims which were brought by Converse uh, in the US in respect of its iconic Chuck Taylor sneaker. Thanks, Annabel. So we've seen the situation on uh, this side of the pond. Let's have a look at what happens on the other side of the pond. So I was interviewed by um, a knife beer, Agence France Presse journalist, back in October 2014 on the um, emerg emergence of, of, of fashion law and, and luxury law. And um, as a result, Eric Randolph, that journalist, published a, um, a rather gritty article about these major lawsuits happening in the fashion and luxury sectors um, and uh, generating, so he says in his article, lots of revenues for lawyers. Well, I'm not sure about that. However, um, it's pointedly actually called that article fashion law is becoming a ridiculously profitable industry and um, I encourage you to read it. Um, one of his uh, uh, me mega lawsuits that uh, um, Randolph actually referred to me in his, uh, in his um, piece was the Converse uh, lawsuits against 31 uh, uh, defendants, uh, which was uh, triggered on the 14th of October 2014, to be precise. Um, and that, that is definitely a, a, big, a big case. So, with its uh, rubber toe front and uh, recognizable star, Converse started America's uh, brand name athletic footwear business long before the likes of Nike, um, Reebok and Adidas crowded that field. Converse introduced the first sneaker uh, created for basketball players, the All-Star, in 1917. Its most popular spokesman, uh, Chuck Taylor, was himself a famous basketball player who joined the company Converse in the 20s. The star was named after him, and generations of American teenagers referred to these shoes as my Chucks. In the entertainment world, Chucks uh, were widely known from um, John Travolta's uh, team, the T-Birds wearing them in Greece, to Rocky Balboa, um, uh, training as a boxer um, in Rocky. However, Converse's and viable perch in pop culture's kingdom has not been consistent. In fact, in the 90s, Converse um, was on the brink of uh, bankruptcy when it was bought by Nike in uh, 2003. And that um, created, researched the brand and created a brand rebirth <coughs> Um, when G Nike gave uh, the All-Star a new push. So, Nike reinvigorated re 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 the brand by expanding the franchise, introducing more colors and style, um, launching some new um, limited editions, for example, I've got the Jimi Hendrix Chuck Taylor <coughs> style, and um, helping to push stars, all stars, into overseas market. For example, I go to fashion trade shows every fashion season in Paris, and every time I go to the man's trade show, which is Rue Avenue to Dick, there is the French distributor of Converse with here uh, from the uh, Royal Sport, and it does a lot of business here. It, it, it sells to a lot of uh, uh, multi brand stores um, at uh, Paris Fashion Week every six months. So reintroducing these same classic shapes that they had in the 50s and 60s uh, really catered to the baby boomers who used to wear them. But in addition to this return, there was also a rebirth in the younger generation who are looking at the trucks and, and like its classic shape. So it's been really a, a commercial success um, as, well as, a, as well as a rebranding success. And uh, while Converse's sales were $203 million um, in 2003, when Nike rescued it, um, in 2014, sales were at $1.7 billion, so not bad, more than eight times um, increase in sales in, um, I think, 11 years. So 
Converse makes up a small, albeit important part of Nike's business, reporting, as I said, $1.7 billion um, dollars out of Nike's $28 billion dollars, um, in sales. Um, the general rule of thumb in footwear is the more volume you do over a single footbed, the better the margin. So the stakes are high. Um, the, um, the Converse is a um, um, money-making machine. Sorry, the Chucks is a, ma a money-making ma machine. But that increase in popularity has also in contributed to an explosion in knockoff activity, uh, to paraphrase Converse's CEO, uh, Jim Calhoun. This copying is not solely um, <coughs> coming from Chinese importers and manufacturers. It is also, according to Converse and Nike, coming from well-established brands such as um, competitors as Skechers, Fila, and, and um, supermarkets uh, like Kmart and Walmart, and also indirect competitors such as Ralph Lauren, one of the US luxury brands, uh, Tory Butch, another premium luxury brand, and H&M. So the press reported that um, since 2008, Converse sent 180 cease and desist letters um, to imitators for poaching the uh, Converse midsole trademark, which is the overall style, and the Converse outsole trademark, which is the diamond patterned rubber exterior. More on this later. To no avail. So, on, as I said, on the 14th of October 2014, Converse filed 13 lawsuits against, um, sorry, filed 22 lawsuits against 31 companies, including um, huge retailers as Walmart and Kmart and major rivals such as Phil and Sketches, for selling and importing knockoff footwear. In parallel um, to these, um, to these lit lit litigation cases, uh, Converse also lodged a complaint with the um, International Trade Commission, which I will refer to as the ITC. And um, um, so there are two parallel actions, one with the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of New York, 22 lawsuits filed for, against 31 companies there, plus also a complaint in relation to the 31 defendants with the ITC. Um, Converse says the companies are infringing its trademark, Writes by copy, uh, copying the core design features of a Chuck, a design Converse described in court documents as probably the most widely recognized in the history of footwear. On October uh, 14, 2014, Converse, <coughs> sorry, I already mentioned that, filed a complaint with the ITC pursuant to Section 337. That is an investigation which is a process whereby the ITC conducts um, investigations into allegations of certain unfair practices in import trade. So what comes into the United States, they look at whether it um, may infringe uh, trademark patents or uh, other forms of unfair competition, such as misappropriation of trade secrets, uh, trade dress infringement, passing off, false advertising, and violation of antitrust laws. Uh, may also be asserted. In the event that the ICT determines that Section 337 is <coughs> violated, it may issue an order barring the products at issue from entry into the United States, as well as a cease and desist order directing the violating parties to seize certain actions. ICT's exclusion orders are enforced by US Customs and Border Protection, and ICT exclusion orders become effective within 60 days of issuance. If appeals of ITC orders entered in Section 377 investigations are heard by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Enough of its admin stuff. Um, let's look at what Converse said about, um, about the, proposed, the 31 proposed respondents. Well, they said that they had um, uh, unlawf unlawfully imported into the U.S. and sold for importation and sold within the U.S. Um, after importation, importation certain footwear products that violate registered and common law trademarks used in connection with certain Converse shoes. Um, while this process is boiling with the ICT, let's look at what is happening with the US District Court for the Eastern District of New York, where Converse filed parallel district court actions against the same 31 respondents. The asserted trademarks are used in connection with um, Converse shoes. Um, in particular, the asserted trademarks include 
two distinct designs, a shoe midsole design and a shoe outsole design. So the trademark, sorry, the trademarked midsole, midsole design is made up of a toe bumper and a toe cap, plus an upper stripe and a lower stripe. The trademarked outsole design includes a design diamond pattern. I'll show, you, I'll show it to you later. So, Converse claims that the trademark rights um, in key feature, in key, uh, in three key features of a Converse have been um, infringed. The rubber bumper running around the front of a shoe. Uh, can you uh, just go backwards, please? Thank you. The rubber bumper. Um, uh, running around the front of a shoe, the toe cap on the top of a shoe, and the lines around the sides. Um, the design is registered under several federal trademarks. This is one of them. And um, another key element of a chuck, interestingly enough, the All Star logo, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, with a star and the ankle, is not claimed in the uh, court papers and the ICT complaint. So. That was registered, by the way, in September 2013. So I, f I think that, you know, Congress had this in the making. They sent the 180 season and letters, got no results. Okay, we're going to file this um, trademark and that just, just sue. So what is the trademark description, actually? It's, um, the mark consists of a design of a two stripes on the midsole of the shoe, the design and of a two cap, toe cap, the design of a multi-layered toe bumper featuring diamonds, and line patterns. And the relative position of these elements to each other. The broken lines show the position of the mark and are not claimed as part of the mark. So this is a description that you can see on the US Patent and Trademark website where you look at this um, description of a trademark. And, and this, is, this is another of the, um, of the um, uh, trademarks that um, Congress says has been infringed. So this is the outsole design uh, which includes this uh, distinct diamond pattern. I mean, if you ask me about this, this uh, yeah, like this sort of drawing, I say, excuse my French, but this is shitty. I mean, you can't see your face. It's just, you, know, you know, but hey, this is on the US, P PTO, uh, the US PTO website, and I took it yesterday. And so this is on what they, the yeah, they are basing themselves to, to claim. So what is the description of this mark, which was, by the way, registered in uh, December 2011? Um, it's the map consists of a three-dimensional trade dress design of the iconic and classic Chuck Taylor all-star basketball shoe for which the following primary features are claimed. A multi-patterned rubber, uh, rubber toe strip. So I suppose that this is... Anyway. Um, the rubber toe strip has four layers of bands featuring intricate and distinct patterns of three-dimensional diamonds and lines. B. Ankle patch on the inside ankle. The run, etc., etc., etc. So you see, the diamond pattern is here. Um, the reference to the fact that it's um, um, rubber and uh, etc. So this is probably one of the uh, trademarks on which um, Converse based its um, its um, actions. And now the last one that I wanted to show you, which I dig uh, dug, dug as well from the USPTO website. This is probably another outsole design, uh, which includes a, uh, a distinct diamond pattern, which. Interestingly enough, is that you know on the on the back on the on the yeah on the sole of a shoe. Uh, the description for this mark, which was registered in the 90s, is um, a three-dimensional sole of shoe design. The lining and stippling in the mark are features of the mark and does not intend to indicate color. So I think that this is on these three trademarks that um, Converse based its action. Converse states in its lawsuit that the proposed respondents import and sell products that violate the asserted trademarks. Um, I want to just take a step back and explain to you what the situation is in the United States of America in relation to fashion design protection. Well, it's not great. Um, there's been a lot of lobbying efforts from the likes of Diane von Furstenberg, who is the president of uh, the Center of uh, uh, fashion um, designers of America and the whole fashion community, many based out of New York, to lobby and get uh, protection, fashion design protection in the United States. 
Um, it has left the US. It has left the US Congress completely unmoved. Um, in particular, the efforts to adopt um, and to pass the Innovative Design Protection Act (IDPA), formerly IDPPPA and DPPA, have totally um, uh, uh, gone nowhere. So the design, the request, sorry, from all these lobbyists was, I think, quite reasonable. They were asking to obtain a three years window of protection for fashion designs, um, you know, with a very detailed list of what those fashion designs would be about. So accessories, stuff, bags, uh, eyewear, belts, uh, clothing garments, but this has really gone nowhere with, with the US Congress so far. So instead, brands such as Converse uh, must use trademarks of designs to assert their rights over the overall look of a product, um, of a products. And a big hurdle for enforcement of these fashion design trademarks is to prove that uh, the purportedly protected features are source designators and not merely functional. The claimant must prove that these designs are not functional, i.e. that uh, they are not utilitarian features that competitors need to incorporate into their own products. Um, so, actually, in the filing documents from October 2014, Congress tried to preempt that question in its complaints and court filings. Um, it, I read what was set out in there. To the extent the design was described in functional terms, Early in its history, whatever functionality it possessed, if any, expired as a footwear design. Development and manufacturing technology advanced over the years. Because there today exist many non-infringing, non-dilutive designs available for others' use, no competitor has any competitive need to use the Converse design, the ITC petition said. The design is intentionally copied because of a goodwill it embodies as a trademark, not because of competitive need or um, functionality. So Converse chief executive Jim Calhoun said that his company um, welcomed fair competition, but this did not give other companies the right to copy the Chuck's Chuck trademarked look. The defendants in the lawsuits have been selling confusingly similar imitations in similar channels of trade, which resulted in a likely confusion. This is another criteria. You need to prove that the public has got a uh, um, likelihood of confusion in relation to two designs, uh, sorry, two products which have almost similar uh, fashion designs. So in order to win their lawsuits, Converse would have to prove that the public may be confused as to the source of the similar products and believe that they were manufactured by Converse, where in fact they were not. The public would therefore be buying the lookalike products without realizing that they are not from Converse. In this lawsuit, Congress has a lot of stake. If they don't make a move, then they could lose their trademark because they're not enforcing their rights. But if they make a move, which we have done because they filed 22 lawsuits against 31 um, defendants, then they could also lose their trademark. Why? Because the first defense strategy for a defendant is to say, you're talking about this trademark, this trademark is invalid. I'm going to ask the invalidity of this trademark. And bang. Very often, you can actually lose a trademark. Louboutin had the same thing. They lost their trademark on the Red Soul um, uh, French registered trademark uh, in front of the French Court de Cassation, the equivalent of a Court Supreme in 2012. And the same thing is happening at the moment with Gucci, because Gucci get, uh, uh, sued Guess uh, about shoes as well. And um, while they, lost, they won in the US um, in 2013, they actually lost in Italy as well as in France recently this year, and they, uh, uh, some of the um, trademarks were cancelled in those two jurisdictions by the courts. So there is a lot at stake for Converse, but um, I agree with Calhoun that at the end of the day he cannot do nothing, so he had to go for it. Um, there's a useful precedent, as I just mentioned, for uh, Converse in this case, and that is the Gucci versus Guess case. In the United States, they won. They won with the Court of Appeal because um, the court, the US court, found that Guess had infringed the interlaced GG logo of, uh, owned by Gucci as well as diamond shaped logo trademark. So this is a no brainer. I think, I think that the, the probability of success of Congress is fairly high, in particular thanks to that uh, uh, existing case law in front of the, district court, the, the New York District Court. So, um, to, sorry? 
did you, say, did you say that they didn't claim the star as part of their... Correct, they did. So, in that case with Gucci, they claimed that they'd infringed the GG logo. Yes. But Converse are not claiming that, that, that their ownership of the star, which probably they would be able to defend. So those two cases are not. I parallel. think that, uh, well they are because of the diamond shaped. As I said, there's another trademark which well, is the diamond shaped. The strategy of logo. Converse here was to not claim the star just in case they lost. No. Nah. To have a second bite at it. Yeah. Second yeah. Bite at the yeah. 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 But no, I, no, I, I agree. Yeah. I agree. But yeah. I think the strategy as well is probably because these infringers were not putting any, you know, stars and all stuff. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. I mean, I'll show you later a, a, a picture of, of, of a uh, an infringing product from Ralph Lauren. Of course, we were not putting the star because this is so obvious. So, but I think you're right, Jonathan. They probably also were, you know. Uh, thinking ahead and say, ooh, they're probably going to ask the um, cancellation of our, all our trademarks. So, uh, so <laughs> let's not take a risk with the old star, which is like really the iconic logo. But yeah, coming back to your point, sir. Um, no, I disagree with you because um, Gucci also uh, asked for the enforcement of its diamond-shaped logo trademark. So um, here, Converse is asking for the um, enforcement of its um, diamond. Uh, striped uh, trademark. So I think, frankly, that case law is really going to be of help uh, to, um, to, uh, uh, to 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 converse in this uh, in this particular instance. But we can have a conversation about this later at the break. Um, okay. So to wrap this up, um, converse, as prob probably <coughs> also mentioned, it is called papers against the 31 infringement infringers infringement of trade dress for designs and infringement of copyright. So what is trade dress? That is the tool which um, is used by fashion designers in the United States when they have to uh, litigate. And it is comprised of three elements. It, it is the, the trade dress is the overall commercial impression of the packaging or product of a design. It may include the size, the shape, the color, the texture, the graphics. Trade dress represents the overall look of a product. And it has to come, it has to be associated with a particular brand, a particular company. And so the best example of this is when everyone in the world looks at a bottle of Coca-Cola, like with a specific design uh, of, of the Coca-Cola bottle, I think that everyone in the world will immediately think of the company Coca-Cola. This is the best example of trade dress. Um, and the third, condition of having <coughs> trade dress um, and being able to, sorry, enforce your IP rights uh, and the trade dress is that there must be some confusion in the mind of a, diff of a public. So <coughs> one infringer or alleged infringer is using this overall look of a product which usually uh, uh, makes you think about another brand and in, well, in fact, this product with this overall look mm -hmm. does not refer to that brand. It's sold by another brand. And therefore, that creates some confusion in the mind of the public. And that third condition of trade dress is rather difficult to prove. However, in this instance, con the Chuck Taylor being so iconic and so uh, widely known as being made by Converse, I think here um, uh, Converse probably has some fair probability of, of also uh, winning uh, the um, a legal argument that uh, his trade dress has been infringed. Uh, watch your space. Um, also, we, you need to prove that trade dress is not functional, again, as in for uh, uh, design trademarks. And then very quickly in passing, uh, fashion designers in America must resort to copyright, so some re residual aspects of copyright when they um, when they, um, um, you know, they, they need to uh, enforce their intellectual property rights on their fashion designs, and uh, in particular, um, uh, fashion <coughs> fabric design is, is protected by residual aspects of copyright. But it's, it's it's quite uncertain and difficult to prove. So there is a, then a fourth way of trying to assert your intellectual property rights on fashion design in the United States. So complicated. It's actually registering a design patent. Ha. So, yeah, so it needs to be a new original and ornamental design for article of manufacture and it protects the way the product looks, but it's expensive, it takes probably two or three years to get, and you know how, you know, fashion is such a seasonal thing and every three months it changes, so, um, and it's also uncertain. 
So it's not a very practical option for fashion designers who need quick system of protection for successful and limited time. However, I think that almost all luxury brands now um, register their iconic products as um, uh, design patterns in the United States. Vaseline, Hermes of World, etc. So, interestingly, uh, yes, um, just to give you a little bit of an, an update on this, but latest news are the following. New Balance actually sued Converse in, uh, I think it was December. Why? Because they were not actually in the list of the 31 infringers who, I mean, sorry, respondents, who um, had been sued by uh, Converse back in October. They were not there. But apparently New Balance team um, approached the legal team of Converse and said, guys, uh, we, know, we, we know we have this brand, uh, PF Flyers, and PF Flyers actually uh, pro you know, sell some products which are very similar in, star in style to the Chuck Taylor. Uh, we know that you've not sued us, so can you actually give us a confirmation in writing that you're not going to sue us? Of course, Converse legal team refused to do so, so bang. Um, you balance filed a, a, a lawsuit with the uh, District of Court of Massachusetts at the end of December um, um, in order to clarify the matter. So, and finally, Ralph Lauren. So, Ralph Lauren is the um, one of the top U uh, luxury brands in the U.S. Um, I think it's, it's everybody will say that La La Ralph Lauren is a luxury brand, and being um, involved in that lawsuit alongside Chinese importers and manufacturers is extremely bad for the brand reputation and image of Ralph Lauren. They decided to settle, obviously. So it was reported on the 21st of January 2015 that the Ralph Lauren Corp and Converse had entered into a settlement agreement and filed a joint motion to terminate the case before the ITC and the US Federal Court of Justice. Per the agreement, um, Women's Wear Daily reports Ralph Lauren will destroy all copycat products named in Converse's complaint. And let's have a look at that. And what do you think? Did they do well to settle? <laughs> yeah, obviously. I mean, obviously. So, um, so yeah, so they're putting their own logo, but the star, mm. the trademarks of Converse, I think they, they, are, they, they did well to settle. Ah, uh, personally, I think so. Any questions? Um, what do you think the outcome would be in Europe if Converse were to sue in Europe? Because obviously we don't have design patents and all that sort of thing. Um, do you think it would be harder in Europe than in the US? Um, I think they would probably use some other intellectual property rights because mm -hmm. thank God for that we have a bit more of a, uh, a protective system yeah. um, in, in, in Europe at least. Um, for protection of fashion design, so we've got the unregistered um, design protection and uh, also sometimes registered, uh, registered uh, uh, designs. Um, I'm fairly sure that the, um, uh, the trademarks of, uh, of uh, the design trademarks of um, Converse have been extended to uh, additional territories than just the US, so they probably also um, are registered in the European Union. So in terms of whether they would have a case here, uh, yeah, of course, I, sh I should think so. I th and, and to answer the second point of the question, whether it, the, the, the chances of success are higher in Europe compared to the US, I, I think they are, yeah, I think it would be easier. But probably they, they beg the biggest territory where they make the most money in, you know, the US, because trucks are so iconic over there. Well, wouldn't Converse have a problem here in, in Europe with the trademark issue on the basis of the product's been in the market since 1917, mm -hmm. and it's been widely copied by lots of other people? and they haven't done anything about it. Haven't they lost their exclusivity to the design? Well, Jonathan, I tell you what, why don't you check <laughs> the registries of, uh, yeah. of Hoim in the Valencia and tell me whether the trademarks have been extended? Because I personally think that it would have been, you know, if they've been registered in the US, <coughs> with the USPTO, which is really quite thorough as an organization before they actually agree to, uh, uh, to register a trademark, I would be very surprised yeah, if we couldn't do a PCT. I, 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 I take it. issue with that. I don't yeah. think the US are at all stringent. They, they're they, they, they very faster. Well, they don't necessarily register faster, but they, yeah. they, 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 they will register uh, more, considerably yeah. more open categories than, than, than OHIM would do. I mean, if oh, I, right, if, well, for, yeah. what, you're talking about software here. And like, no, 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 we're talking about trademark. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's not, I mean, 
Okay, if you're acting for a Chinese knockoff merchant, then I wouldn't run the argument. But say you're acting for yeah. someone like Clark's, and you say, well, I've been producing this since 1950, yeah. and nobody's challenged us yet. And also, you got, you got, having a registered trademark is one thing, but really all you've done is demonstrated to a, and I'm going to be rude to them, but a low-ranking civil servant that your mark is capable of being distinctive and therefore within the law. It's mm. only when you actually get in front of Mr. Judge do you actually get your case tested. I mean, that's the that, same I mean, I can't, I can't pronounce myself because I haven't looked at the records of Huawei. So um, Annabelle, I've actually looked at them. They do have... Um, Thank you. Uh, they've got a number of similar... To oh, the US, absolutely. which have most of them have been withdrawn, and there's one, the one of the Seoul, um, which was registered but is pending cancellation. Pending cancellation. Oh, so yeah. You've also got the it's so like, for example, in the US, um, our friends at Apple applied for and obtained a registration of the layout of their shop. Also, oh, yeah. you're absolutely yeah. right. Now, of course, that they, they obtain that on the basis of evidence of distinctiveness mm -hmm. uh, uh, acquired through use. But the interesting point there is is that they had created something new, they had monopolised it and controlled that, and then showed that they are the single provider of that particular get-up. The problem that Converse have got is that there is a proliferation, there is a complete dilution of their rights in terms of rubber bumpers at the end of tunnels so and things like that. if you were a uh, trademark attorney, what would you say to them, to Converse? What would you say in Europe? How can you, you know, file a similar lawsuit here? What would you say? What well, the, would first, you the, first, the, first thing that, the first thing that I would do if I was going to buy Converse mm -hmm. was I would, I would adopt the Arsenal Football Club uh, line yeah. of attack. All right, well... Uh, the Arsenal, you know? the, the Arsenal Football Club line of attack was to change the logo. Mm -hmm. They slightly altered the cannon and reversed it so it pointed in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. As a result from that, they could then monopolise that, they could then claim the copyright in that, they could register that as trademark, and then anybody who wanted to use the new logo and the new letter were clearly infringing the new rights. It's a bit like, conversely, to use that bad word, <laughs> it's a bit like the England Rugby yeah, Club I mean, trying to monopolise a rose on a white shirt. It doesn't exist. As Catherine said before in her talk, I mean, why would you change something that works? I mean, if you've got to some... Protect it, to protect it. Well, yeah, but the goodwill is in the old star and the, and the, mar like and the, and the star. I mean, I, 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 I think that... But they're not having an issue with the star or converse name. Yeah. They're having an issue with the design features of a shoe. Uh, Just okay, like so the boots on had with his red change soles. slightly the, the, the design features of a shoe so that... Yeah, but, I mean, well, how would you change it? For me, when I see this, I, oh, okay, that's that's a converse for me. You know, it's, so, you, so you what could, would you change? You could put you could put a slightly different um, ending rather than a straight up and down. You could make it come down like this. You could put some other elements of features around around the sole, so you identify that and you bring your brand into a more a protectable environment rather than leaving it with something which is a, an unprotectable environment. I, just because you can take a lawsuit, you can. I can sue Coca Cola today. It doesn't mean I'm going to win. No. Yeah. So just because you can take an action, and you take it in the court of New York because there are a bunch of numpties, and the fact <laughs> is, at the end of the day, the USPTO, they'll go, oh yeah, they've registered that. The first defence, as you quite rightly said, is to apply for invalidation of all of your rights. I don't infringe, go away. It's Besides also their biggest, uh, I think their biggest market is the United States. Right, interesting point of view. Any I other questions? I agree with what's been said before, and I think, you know, ultimately you have to say, you know, you have to advise Converse that yes, you know, I might be able to get you some registered trademark protection here, but it's only when it comes to enforcement that you recognise the true breadth of your protection. Mm. Um, you know, for example, the diamond design, as far as I was concerned, that was just some sort of cross-hatching in the Correct. October, but, you know, which is very small. Yeah. Well, you have to describe the mark, it's an yeah. indication that it's not yeah. really a trademark. Yeah. Mm. It, yeah, it's kind of yeah. that distinctiveness because so oh, after context. so many years, yeah. 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 there are so yeah. many thin souls, yeah. you know, an obvious one as well. But yes. Well, I'm thinking of green flash trainers. And yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I've, I've worked, I do ads and stuff, but I've always worked with a lot of conflict stuff. So, to me, I may not win against uh, people who are ripping off their, their look, but. Would you ever advise a client like Converse to say, well, really go up to town and sort of sue all these people, use that as a sort of marketing exercise to reinforce your authenticity? To of course. Brand? That happens all the time. I'll, I'll, I'll actually mention that in my Absolutely. second yeah. talk on the talk of so IP rights. That's a strategy, so, really of course. Yeah. Of course. Well, I mean, um, obviously, 
And it's very difficult to prove that the starting litigation is groundless, you know. It's very difficult for a defendant to say, why, why are you suing me? I mean, is that, is that a competition strategy or is that really, a, we're talking really about something legal? But it happens all the time. But it's, for a, from a defendant's perspective, it's very difficult to prove that uh, litigating was groundless and it was just for the exercise of, um, you know, asserting your reputation and enforcing your rights. Yeah. Yeah, it's part of a, it's part of a, of a, of a, of a shadow, I guess. Education's not about right or wrong, it's about he who shouts loud and has got the deepest pockets. Mm -hmm. I was about to say, and has got the money. Um, you mentioned the test in the US is confusingly similar for trademarks. So Sorry? That, you mentioned the test was confusingly similar, the test that the court is going to use. Did I mention that? Um, Sorry, I don't think I mentioned that, but, um, well, okay, sorry. It well, would I, be a test. Okay, so I thought, well, confusingly similar, I thought was, um, oh, yes, indeed. For, for in the mind of the public. Yeah, so when, yes. when the court is going to um, assess the infringing product, um, I assume it's going to be something like confusingly similar in terms of the trademark. And I assume that's about origin. No, I think it's um, confusion about, the, about who made that product. Confusion in the mind of the public when he sees that. Well, when a member of a member of the public sees this uh, and goes, oh, this is a converse. Oh, actually, no, it's not. There's a Ralph Lauren, Ralph Lauren Polo logo here. Yeah. I think this is the test that they need to apply. Yeah. That was my, sorry, sorry, sorry. That, was gonna be my, so that was going to be my follow up question. So the, the Ralph Lauren logo is there on that shoe. Yes. So presumably a member of the public is going to think that's from Ralph, Ralph Lauren, not Congress. Well, you know, there are some surveys being done like this. I mean, one of our. Uh, pro evident, proof of evidence you can bring in court and say, okay, I've done a survey of my customers, I've done a survey on the sample of total amount of people in the United States of America, and here are the questions we've asked, and here are the answers. And they all said that they thought that this shoe was actually manufactured and sold by Converse, for example. So, so, so it needs to be a very um, um, a, you know, factual approach as to whether the um, uh, members of the public are going to be confused in their mind about the um, origin of this product. I mean, who manufactured it? Sorry, I, I know I'm speaking to that and I apologize. Surely, right. surely the test is a comparison of the registered trademark as sitting on the USPTO records, and you've already demonstrated the, the, the poor quality of the representations that are there, and the judge will take that as a registered mark against the mark that is the, the, the shoe that is being sold by the potential infringer. So it is a comparative test between what is on the register. Mm -hmm. Yes, as well. Not, not what do Converse sell. It is what is, if you're infringing a registered trademark, you must infringe the registration. You don't infringe the shoe. So it's a comparative test of what is on the register against <coughs> what is being sold. And therefore, the quality of your representations and the quality maybe of your description will also be indicative as to whether or not the infringer infringes. I Thank think you. from what you read in the summary, it was both the registered and the common law trademark, so both tests would apply in that case. Yeah, I think when they mentioned the common law, they were referring to a trade dress. I would be very surprised if in the, in the court filing they were only referring to the design trademarks and not to and the trade dress. And if they don't infringe the registered trademark, they're really not going to get up the hill on common law, which is essentially passing off. So uh, in, in the US, so by definition, you know, you have a registered trademark because you say, well, there it is. It's quite clear. I just have to prove confusing similarity. I don't have to have to prove goodwill. They may have goodwill, but they're unlikely to. If they can't win on on trademark infringement, they're really unlikely to get, get many much money out of passing off. Fair enough. Fair enough. Passing off as well. I shouldn't have mentioned that. Guys, we've got to wrap up because yeah. there's another, another um, speaker. So, uh, yeah, is that all right? Great. Thank you very much, Sam <laughs> Bell. Come to me after the talk if you want to speak. Thank you.